This is the CV that got me my first position in a university. I just finished my PhD, I'd spent a year in industry as an explosives chemist, and uh, I decided that I wanted to go back into academia, and this was the CV that actually convinced someone, surprisingly, that I was good enough to be welcomed into their research program. So I'm gonna share with you all of the uh, ins and outs and sections and embarrassing bits um, of my CV, but also I think what it should do is give you an idea about what a CV looks like at the end of a PhD, what you can include in it, what's important, because as you're going through your PhD, you should be taking note of these particular things and uh, achievements and experience that you can note in your CV. And don't worry, at the end of this video, I'm gonna just give you an absolutely definitive list of what should be in a PhD student or a PhD graduate CV. Here it is in all its glory. This is my beautiful curriculum vitae. I don't even know how you say that. I'm, I, it's Latin, I assume, but okay, CV, you get it. There's me, Dr. Andrew John Stapleton. And then straight up the front, uh, personal details. I don't know why they were included, but I've blanked them out so you can't come find me. Um, Overall, career goals and ambitions. We'll get into the details as we go along. Qualifications, current employer, research experience, undergraduate experience, undergraduate research, any scholarships I got, publications in peer reviewed journals, conference publication and output, my lab skills, undergraduate research, computer skills, other skills, um, so many skills, uh, deep teaching experience, interests and hobbies. What on earth was I thinking? Um, and then we've got referees down the bottom. So first of all, one thing I wanna point out is how ugly this CV is. Look, anything in academia, it doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to be functional. And that's kind of like the, uh, I guess the motto by which I've decided to live my life. Um, so let's have a look. So career goals and ambitions, this first section, I guess what I really wanted to achieve with this was to talk about my, uh, my career ambitions, but importantly, how that related to the job I was going for. So I was applying for a postdoc position and it was looking at transparent electrodes for uh, solar cells, which I had done during my PhD. So here we are in three sentences or three lines. Uh, this is what I decided. The first thing people should know about me. I have a varied research history. Oh, yuck. Like. I cannot think of a worse opening line than that. Um, varied, re it's just so broad. I should have gone in with something much more, like um, much more solid, much more concrete. But okay, with strong backroid, in, <laughs> backroid? <laughs> with a strong background in colloid and surface chemistry and organic photovoltaic devices. Okay, so that should have been up front. That should have just been, I am a research scientist with a strong background in blah. I wish to apply, oh, so formal, Andy. I wish to apply my chemical education. What on earth does chemical education mean? Um, you know, my skills and experience, I guess, in a research environment to prove, improve the areas of OPV devices, which should have been abbreviated up here so that people know what that's all about. Overcoming problems with practical applications. Oh, marketing 101 for my PhD uh, experience and skills. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure that I really achieved what I wanted to achieve, but clearly it was good enough. Um, and importantly, this top section, I always change for each uh, job that I went for. So that's probably why it was a little bit weird. I, I didn't really sort of really do my best at making sure that was aligned with the job. Uh, so yeah, this is this bit, I, it should be the most powerful bit and it was just not really that at all. So uh, yeah, anyway, make sure that the first thing people read about you, if you are gonna include a career goals thing is uh, actually interesting and impactful. All right, then we go to the boring stuff. At this point, I'd done my PhD and uh, here's my honors as well, just to show where I'd come from. There's no point in including your undergraduate. They kind of know you've uh, graduated. So if you've got, um, you know, a, a master's or a PhD, those are really the important things. This is like 
check checking a box, ticking a box for the people in HR and the people that are going to employ you. So don't worry too much about including all of your qualifications, just the most relevant ones to the job you're going for. And in this case, it was my two postgrads, so my PhD and my master's. So there we are, that's where they all are, aren't they great? Current employment, I was at Dino Nail Bell, I'd been there for about a year at this point, and key roles. Okay, overall, yeah, that's fine, that has to be in there, it's part of the box ticking. Um, and then research experience. Because I was going for a, um, for a research position, it had to be that I included the appropriate research. Now, it can get a little bit too long, so don't include too much when you're doing this, but just like a couple of sentences or a couple of, like a paragraph per research experience. So here we are, postgraduate research, this was my PhD. Um, application and refinement of mini emulsion process yielding colloidal nanoparticles, evaluation of nanoparticle morphology and surface interactions of colloidal suspensions, incorporation, you get it, you can read it. So that is what I did. It was just a bullet point list of the important factors of what I did and how I did it. And then like I always put in this where applicable possible devise and implement strategies to improve device performance and rectify problems. That's just like a catch all for like, also I did loads of other stuff as well. And my undergraduate research, complex inorganic synthesis. Oh, I'm so complex. Of metal substituted polyoxymetallate anions characterized with phos phosphorus and MR. Nice. So there we are, there's all of the kind of most important parts about your research experience. If you're going for something academic, academic, that is absolutely what needs to be in there. But I'm gonna share with you in a moment my CV that I had when I was trying to transition into science communication um, sort of jobs and areas and applying for those sort of roles. And it's very, very different. So um, yeah, you'll see how the CV has to be changed to match what you're actually doing. So let's continue, scholarships. Yep, those are what people gave me. Well done me. And here is probably more important. It should have probably gone above scholarships, but it's publications, journal articles. These are really the kind of thing that people are looking for if you're going for an academic position, which is essentially the university and the supervisor going, how can you make our careers better? You need to publish stuff to make us look good. So can you do it? Have you got a past record of it? And here you can see that some of the articles I've included are not even um, published. They are articles in press. So I've got my one from my, my master's degree, then, oh actually my, my undergraduate degree, that one, well done me. So 2009, 2010, and then I had these submitted at the end of my PhD, which were on their way to being uh, published. And I think they actually did get sort of published somewhere, but at this time they hadn't. And then at the time, um, I sort of like been to a number of different publications. I've been to one in the UK, in Australia, um, and also people had been sort of like giving presentations that included my work. A little bit cheeky, if you ask me, to include these, because Boffy really did that, whereas I didn't. But that's okay, because uh, yeah, maybe it shouldn't have been in there, but I was just trying, oh, it's a different text as well. That's no good, Stapleton. Look at that, you, that really stands out. All right, anyway, I, I clearly added this in afterwards and it, I shouldn't have. And then also there was a televised presentation about my work broadcast uh, by the ABC and uh, it was all about solar paint. So yes, I think that's probably quite good to be in there, to be like, not only is my research relevant to a general audience, but it was good enough to be uh, published. Uh, uh, and televised. So yeah, I think that's pretty good. And then ultimately, this is uh, another important part, lab skills, all of the stuff that I did, all of the different skills that I bring. And it's probably a good idea for you to actually like put down what you do and make a list of all of the skills. You'd probably be surprised about how many you can actually sort of like list out. Um, and I probably should have just put this in two columns because you know, and then undergraduate research uh, lab skills. I should have put that next to each other. Computer skills, if there's anything special that you do, remember to include the, uh, yeah, the, the package, the program. So here, theoretical computational investigations using Gaussian and Spartan. I don't even remember doing, I do remember doing that. I don't remember how to use them now. And then LaTeX um, and Microsoft Office, blah, blah, and all the normal stuff, great. And other skills, at this point, I'd got some pretty weird skills with senior first aid and also unsupervised handling license of security sensitive ammonium nitrate. Hmm, suspicious. 
uh, and also teaching experience. Well, teaching experience should have probably gone up a little bit because I'm saying in this academic role that yeah, you know, I can actually teach and I have to taught. So I guess what I'm getting with all this is there's a certain sort of like priority and you should put all of the stuff that's more relevant to the job you're applying for above all of the other stuff that is just like a little bit box ticky. You know, qualification, sure, at the top, but then think about what would actually impress people and put the biggest and most important things first and go down in decreasing order. Um, and then interests and hobbies, right. I, I, I don't know if that should be there. I mean, really, my interest was like, you know, laying down and not doing very much. So here I try to impress people. I don't know why this is even here. I think this is a throwback from when I had my first ever job in a department store in Plymouth. So uh, yeah, look, maybe this doesn't have to be in there. Uh, teaching and playing percussion for Newcastle Salsa and Samba Band. Boom. Look at me. I, I was in, fun fact, I was in Newcastle's premier sam salsa band called Chunky Salsa. Yuck. That was a bad name. I didn't choose it. I had an, I had an idea for another one, but not good, is it? Um, and then uh, referees, that goes at the end, great. So there we are, there's my CV. Um, I think the important thing is, is that it would should go from most important to least important. And really you wanna hit the reviewer, the person looking at this CV in the face immediately with the most re relevant information. And I don't think I achieved this necessarily, but I got the job anyway because my skills were so closely related to the PhD I just done. And obviously now the, the research position I was going into, like it was a, an amazing match. Like it was just so perfect. And I think that's the primary reason um, why they kind of started to, you know, call me in for an interview and that sort of stuff. Um, all right, I just wanna show you very quickly how CVs change depending on what you are applying for. Here is my science communicator CV. And you can see, first of all, much nicer formatted. It's actually, it can be printed out in black and white with no issues. Um, and here you'll see that the focus, and I think I've done it much better in this CV, the focus is on the science communication aspects and less about the pure academic kind of like qualifications and outputs that I've sort of achieved. So here, education, yeah, you know, doctor of philosophy, masters, that stays the same. But importantly, my education at this point should also be pointed out that I did a video production course at TAFE SA and I did an introduction to radio um, at Australian Radio School because I was trying my hand at being a bit of a radio presenter. Hmm. And then professional experience. So here you can see it's not in chronological order. And in fact, like I've got my science communicator stuff right up front, well done me, putting all of the most relevant stuff right at the very top. And here I've got workshops, you know, science writing, video production, science communication, com 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 columnist for Australian Quarterly, freelance writer and podcaster for Science Alert, Cosmos, a ABC Radio National, MIT, which I'll link below and Australia Science Channel, producer and presenter of Published Perishable Podcast, my podcast, which was running for five years, and Percussive, Science and Percussion Workshops. Bit of a stretch to try to include science and percussion together, but I did it nonetheless. And then my experience, you know, Cosmos Magazine intern, and then this is where I couldn't hide behind the fact that I was essentially a lab monkey. So there it all was, one page. Um, and like I said, I did it much better on this one. Publications, this is where it really changes. So instead of putting all of my academic outputs, all I have to say here is 15 peer reviewed you know, papers and six international conference publications. They can ask more later if they want, but then here, this is the most important thing, science communication outputs. So I should probably have put that at the top, but Australia Science Channel host, content producer, um, Radio National, Ockham Razor, Science Alert, Weekly Articles, Cosmos Magazine, Australasian Science, Blogger, RIOS Video Blog Competition. That's a, That was a great video, I can share it with you. TEDx presentation, anyway, so there we have it, awards and honors, all of the stuff that I got, content production and IT skills, because this one was really about um, producing different content for uh, different science communication channels. And then obviously I've got my referees, and notice they're not academic at all. They are the editor at Science Alert at the time, um, Australia's um, editor, Bill Condy, and then Matt Salir, um, 
which was uh, my sort of like director at the New Venture Institute at Flinders University, where I had my startup, my science communication startup. So I was matching the people that they were gonna to talk to, to the skills that I wanted to sort of show. So I think this is a perfect example of matching the CV to what you're actually trying to get, the job you're trying to get. And it, the fluff is cut out of this because the fluff can go in the application letter, in the cover letter, in the, you know, addressing the criteria, which is a whole nother pain in the ass. But overall, this is, this, this is what really, um, you know, a CV should look like uh, if you're getting outside of academia, leave all of the academic stuff behind and really focus on the skills that you've built and the evidence you've got to actually address this, the thing that you're applying for. I think that's the most important thing. Um, all right, there we are. There are my two academic and non-academic CVs. So as a PhD student and someone looking to get a job after your PhD, what should you include and what should you keep track of? Well, essentially it's this list. Keep track of your education, that one's easy. Keep track of your research interests and also what you do in each role. If you're doing a separate project for someone, just make a little list of what you actually do and the skills that you've got, any awards you get. So applying for awards is a massive pain in the bum and it can be sort of like a little bit disheartening when you don't get them even though you feel like you should, but keep applying for different awards. Anything that can make you stand out I think is perfect. So um, yeah. Go for it, why not? Get people, I actually, look, here's a little secret. So I actually used to find awards that people had to use to nominate me for. And I used to go to my supervisor and be like, can you nominate me for this award? And they were like, sure. And that is how you get more awards in your belt. I actually did all of the paperwork for it and they just had to sign off on it and check and put their own little personal details. I don't know if that's ethical, but that's what I did. Um, Publications, peer-reviewed publications, conference presentations, any output where you are speaking to your um, field or your collaborators or you know anything uh, that you do in a conference, just take a note, keep a running list. Um, professional experience, if you're sort of like, you know, doing anything with industry or if you're doing anything outside of your PhD, keep track of that is absolutely valuable information. Teaching experience, any skills, like I said, go through and list out those skills. You'll be amazed at what you can actually achieve um, and the amount of sort of like knowledge you can gain throughout a PhD, keep track of those skills, instrumental skills, analytical skills, any sort of like, you know, coding skills, anything like that that will help future-proof your, um, your CV and also any skills that a prospective employer may like, perfect. And references. Make sure you speak to your references beforehand. It was one top tip someone once gave to me, which was just call up your, your references and just... Uh, say, would you be willing to be a reference for me? Because sometimes they don't want like a little bit of call out of the blue, you know? And also if you apply for a job, just let them know, send them an email being like, hi, I've just applied for this job. Maybe you'll get a call, um, just a heads up. And I think that is a nice way. They're expecting it, they're, they're still in the loop. Um, and uh, yeah, it's better than, you know, someone calling up and then being like, who? Who is this? Why are you calling me? Um, and it just doesn't give the right impression. But if they're expecting it and it can be a nice warm kind of discussion, great. And a little bit of an unethical tip that I learned. It's not unethical, maybe it's a bit tricky. Essentially, you get one of your friends to call up your referees and ask them about you. And if they're not very good at giving you, like, you know, showing you off in your best light, probably swap them out for someone that is. So get one of your friends to call them up and uh, ask some questions about you and see if they're actually any good at it. There's a top tip for you. All right, done. So there we have it. There is the CV that managed to get me my first job at a university after my PhD and all of the things that you should keep track of during your PhD so that you can put your best foot forward. Let me know in the comments what you would add and also go check out academiainsider.com. That's my project where I've got my ebook, The Ultimate Academic writing toolkit as well as the PhD survival guide and my insider forum as well. And uh, that's it. I'll see you in the next video.